So, um, so uh, thank you everyone. Saturday afternoon. Welcome, Dr. Deepa. It was great to finally meet you and have you on the webinar. Hello, Dr. Mantan, our in-house expert on everything to do with digital therapeutics and cardiology for us. So uh, welcome both the speakers. So uh, today our topic is so it's a, a simple discussion on this very interesting uh, cardio renal nexus in diabetics. So there is a very high prevalence of cardio renal complications in people already uh, living with diabetes. So could you, Mantan, uh, I'll start with you. Could you give me an overview of what is this whole interrelation between the uh, heart and the kidneys and diabetes? Sure, sure, Nilesh. I think. Uh... You know, this is uh, an optimum time where we are talking about this because uh, back when all of us uh, read books on diabetes, when chapters were smaller and now they've started getting bigger and bigger in textbooks. Uh, and there was all, all the focus was only on, you know, glucose control. And uh, we all for the longest time that we've known diabetes know of its complications. We've tried and understood it, uh, tried to decipher it, right? Multiple studies have been done to understand what happens in the long run to diabetes. And today, if you talk to anybody, uh, in fact, uh, there is an interesting paper on time to do more, where they say, uh, what are the first few things that your doctor tells you about diabetes complications? And then over the years, they've seen that it used to initially be, you know, your eyesight will go bad and your kidneys will go bad. Later, they started saying, you know, it affects your heart. It affects, uh, you know, you can get heart failure. So it has, it has evolved over time. And uh, now, because there are, of course, agents which do cardiorenal protection as well. So, you know, that understanding has again evolved. So now we are not just looking at diabetes as a singular uh, disorder. So we knew it's a polygenic disorder. We, try, we know that there is no one single cause, but we also know it's not a single organ disease, right? And uh, uh, I think at the core of it is always insulin resistance and dysglycemia, which goes ahead and, you know, affects your kidneys in the terms of perfusion. And Dr. Deepa will, of course, elaborate on that. Um, also further goes down to the heart, you know, leads uh, to atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease as well as heart failure. And then, you know, you have the common soil hypothesis that says that, you know, both of these disorders actually originated from the common soil. So uh, a lot of time it's chicken and the egg story where we are not sure whether uh, diabetes came first or heart disease came first. And uh, um, if you look at the nurses health study as well, which was done in the UK, uh, looked at all these people, uh, you know, who come with heart disease and they saw how early they were in diabetes. And if you could actually have picked up the diabetes earlier, they would have not landed up with heart disease. So uh, the nexus is quite strong. And uh, I think we all uh, have to get together to break it and not look at the disease in silence. Dr. Deepa, your thoughts, how do, how do I put it together in one package, the, 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 all the disorders together? So the thing is, I view it as not a single organ dysfunction. If you think about diabetes and then you look at the kidney, it's never in isolation. You always have to look at it as a total effect. And in fact, if you have kidney disease and you're a diabetic, then automatically your risk of cardiovascular complication exemplifies. And many a times, even before there is progression of uh, CKD to the point where you actually end up needing dialysis, a lot of our patients actually end up having adverse cardiovascular outcomes and they don't even make it till the time they actually require dialysis. And this proteinuria, as we will probably discuss a little later, um, it is one of the uh, earliest uh, markers, not just of kidney uh, disease, but it also portends an adverse cardiovascular outcome. So proteinuria is really not that benign uh, and uh, cannot be viewed uh, just simply relating to the kidney, but it's, it's a signal that the kidney lets out that because of the diabetic milieu, there are changes happening in the entire body system, particularly in the endothelial level, the vascular level. And one of it that you check in the form of what is coming out of the kidney is albuminuria. So I always think about this bidirectional effect where any kind of change in the heart, either acute or chronic, can affect the kidney, both acute and chronic. And together, both of them actually increase your risk of uh, 
mortality, that is the most important outcome that we really are worried about, um, compared to if you just look at the diabetic patient alone without these complications. Because of which we need to do this a little bit more seriously and not just think about it in the form of, yes, I just need to control my sugar. But beyond that, what is happening to the rest of my body system, particularly this whole uh, connect between the kidney and the heart, because one gets affected automatically, the other also shows changes. Now, that's typically what you talk about, this cardiorenal syndrome. Uh, and that actually increases your risk of mortality and mortality. So I think it's very important that we understand we have to view this in total and not in isolation. It's just one organ protection. Right, ma'am. So, ma'am, continuing with uh, on the same theme, so how early do I expect to see a, a, a kidney a dysfunction in diabetics? So is, do I uh, suspect it after four years, five years? Is there a time period? Um, actually speaking, many a times, uh, at least now the awareness is more, but oftentimes in clinic when we see our patients who get referred to us uh, from various uh, practitioners, you know, they come to us at a point where their kidney disease is actually so advanced that we are ending up treating complicated mm -hmm. We're ending up trying to uh, discuss about dialysis, renal replacement therapy, etc., which is too late. So then the question comes, how can we pick up these question, people earlier and what are your symptoms that happened earlier? The challenge here is kidney disease doesn't announce and come. Okay, especially in your type 2 diabetics, a lot of them at the time of diagnosis itself may be having some component of kidney disease. And importantly, people are not even aware of it because there are no telltale signs. The kidney has so much of reserve that up until you have very advanced uh, decrease in your GFR, wherein you start manifesting symptoms, by and large, for the most part, patients don't have any symptoms, which is why in, in our uh, especially amongst our patient population, they don't like visiting a doctor unless you have particular, uh, you know, signs that, uh, or any, any kind of complaint. So a lot of times these patients are reluctant to go to the doctor um, to check out their kidneys because they feel everything is okay. So to answer your question, if you look at a type 2 diabetic, they could be having uh, kidney disease right at the onset of, the, of diagnosis of their type 2 diabetes uh, because you don't know when the type 2 diabetes began. Whereas in type 1 diabetics, uh, generally if you're considering kidney disease due to diabetes or due to type 1 diabetes, uh, and since the onset of type 1 diabetes is quite abrupt, it may take about five years of the diabetic milieu to then show changes in the kidney function. And that too, you have to screen for it. It may not come announced. So you have to uh, screen for it amongst your patients so that you are identifying this cohort early. The other change that has happened in the last few years is our age-old, in fact, when I trained, age-old tra uh, teaching was that if you, ha that you have this whole course where it starts off with hyperfiltration, then there is microalbuminuria, that terminology is also changed now, that progresses to macroalbuminuria, and then there is progressive decline in GFR. But really, it doesn't follow this path. There are a lot of diabetics who have di kidney disease or chronic kidney disease due to diabetes, but may not have albuminuria. They may just have progressive decline in eGFR. So there, are, there is this sector of population too, wherein if you don't see albuminuria, but if you find the creatinine clearance gradually coming down, that also is a red flag. So they could also be having a form of diabetic uh, kidney disease. So identifying these people becomes important. So time frame wise, you have to start suspecting or at least being on the watch out right from the time you have the diagnosis of type 2 diabetes and at least a minimum of five years after you have the diagnosis of type 1 diabetes. Especially if they have other risk factors like high blood pressure, obesity, uh, family history, smoking, etc. Thank you, thank you. Uh, so, Mantan, coming to you. Uh, so, uh, we have seen that many large trials have shown us there's a that there's a reduction in microvascular complications when you control uh, a, a glucose well. But so, what what is the current data? How are CV complications connected? and correlate with intensive uh, glucose control. Right. Uh, so Nesh, if we, if we look at all those legacy trials, as we call it, right, the UKPDS, the VADT, Accord, and all of those, uh, the objectives were very different, right? They wanted to see how intensive control uh, affects a population versus uh, not having a very tight control. Mm -hmm. And uh, within those arms, of course, they were very long-term studies, right? And it's very difficult today if we actually plan and the way those studies were planned, uh, a lot of them may not 
uh, be feasible in today's time. But they were not done uh, primarily with the outcome of what we today look at as cardiovascular outcome plans. So traditionally, uh, all these older studies have not done something to assess cardiovascular. Outcome. Their whole aim was to see that if I control a group better versus a group uh, is just controlled. So controlled and well controlled, if you want to uh, put it in simplified terms, what happens to events. Now, in most of those, we did see that, you know, of course, like you said, microvascular complications are definite reduction. And the evidence for the ma macrovascular complications or cardiovascular complications remained as questionable. Questionable again for, for two facts. One, uh, like I said, the trial were not, were not done to do that. Um, two, because in uh, a few, if we talk about it, like Accord, for example, where we saw that, you know, in the intensive arm, for example, there was a little bit of higher mortality that was seen. Later, when we reanalyzed and relooked at the data, it came that that was attributed to hypoglycemia in the intensive arm. Uh, and we know, right, hypoglycemia is worse for the heart compared to even hyperglycemia. And, uh, but all these trials did show us something called as the legacy effect, which we talk about that every, you know, one year that you spend in good control of diabetes versus uh, poor, di poorly controlled diabetes shows some effects at the end of five years, at the end of 10 years and all of that. And all of those legacy effects have shown us that good control or intensive control over the years will lead to reduced cardiovascular complications, be it in the form of the incidence of stroke, um, be it MACE, which is, could be any of your major adverse cardiovascular events, or be it cardiovascular mortality. So, uh, you know, intensive control and early intensive control. So, uh, a lot of times if we, you know, actually look at the diabetes space, we always talk about inertia, right? And uh, early treatment intensification, which doesn't happen. Uh, and a lot of people believe that it's okay. Uh, you know, that we keep it a little lax, let it be at 7, let it be at 7.5, let it be at 8 for the first few months, and we'll gradually do it, you know, because a uh, lot of things, right? Uh, sometimes you don't want to scare the patient, sometimes you want to gradually look at it. Uh, but that inertia is quite damaging to all patients in the long run, because uh, the earlier you control blood sugar, uh, you know, you reduce risk to the tune of 30 to 60 percent at the end of five years. And uh, we have more and more data which talks about this. So it's, you know, good to give our patients a good glycemic legacy so that, you know, they can prevent all the cardiovascular complications for sure. And good control will also lead to, you know, poor microvascular, com lesser microvascular complications um, as well. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Martha. Uh, Dr. Deva, coming back to you. So we were talking about uh, diagnosing uh, uh, kidney disorders earlier, you could do, do some tests. So uh, are these tests the, do, being done regularly in diabetic clinics? So we have these clinics who just uh, uh, work for uh, work in diabetes. So are these tests being done regularly over there? And what are the kind of tests which are normally done over there? So if you talk about are they being regularly done, uh, to a large extent, I'm going to answer that probably not as much as it should be done because we are now postulated to be the diabetic capital in 2025, right? If I'm not mistaken. And uh, how many of our patients actually get screened in terms of uh, whether they have only telltale signs of kidney disease? Uh, so probably we need to do a lot more. So when you talk about regularly, what, what is the frequency that you're looking at? So if a patient has been recently diagnosed with uh, type 2 diabetes, then right at the time of diagnosis, even if they do not have any signs and symptoms, of kidney-related problems or any particular urine-related symptoms, you still have to check them out with two main things. One is you have to do a serum creatinine. And with that, you have to calculate the estimated GFR because creatinine alone is not going to be helpful until and unless you actually calculate the GFR. And most of the times, we use a, a lot of these verified formula these days to uh, where it imputes the serum creatinine and it calculates uh, your estimated GFR. The, um, the most uh, commonly used one these days is the CKD FD formula 2021. And that uh, looks into your uh, gender, your serum creatinine and your age. And with that, it can calculate what your GFR is. Because ultimately, the, the reason why you look at creatinine is to understand what the glomerular filtration is. And that is what is key important. So don't look at creatinine alone. It really is not important. And the other thing, even if your creatinine is normal and your EGFR comes to be normal, 
but you still need to see whether you are leaking protein in minute amounts. So a urine routine is not fully sensitive because in the dipstick of urine routine, unless your uh, albumin levels are more than 300 milligrams per gram, it's not going to turn positive. So what about the levels of protein that are being leaked above normal, but not to the extent that it has reached 300 milligrams? So this is the uh, area uh, of the zone that needs to be picked up. And for that, you need to specifically measure urine albumin to creatinine ratio. So some, sometimes this question often comes up, urine albumin to creatinine ratio, why don't you just do urine albumin? Why do you have to do creatinine? Because when you look for urine albumin, if it is present in, say, uh, low quantities, and you think everything is okay, you have not taken into account the volume dilutional factors. What if it's a very dilute urine? Then even if they are having a higher protein excretion, you have not factored in that effect because the uh, volume dilution factor is not being calculated. So for that, we uh, also measure the urine creatinine and we do the ratio and we get something called a spot urine albumin to creatinine ratio. If you're looking at it as a general screening test, then something which is very easy to be done, it cannot be cumbersome. It cannot put the patient under too many restrictions because then it won't be uh, very feasible to do it in large scale. So um, an untimed, Spot urine albumin to creatinine ratio will also work because that will take away the volume dilution factor. And in that sample, if you have the urine albumin to creatinine ratio, which is say between 30 to 300 milligrams per gram, okay. uh, milligrams of albumin per gram of creatinine, then that falls into the range of uh, previous microalbuminuria is now called moderately elevated albuminuria. And the previous uh, macroalbuminuria range terminology is not used anymore. We don't use microalbumin or macroalbumin. We use moderately elevated proteinuria, which is 30 to 300 milligrams per gram, and severely elevated albuminuria, which is more than 300 milligrams per gram. So you have to do these two things. Check the uh, untimed urine sample, spot urine sample for albumin to creatine ratio. And you do a marker to estimate their GFR, which in uh, most commonly what we do is serum creatinine and use that to calculate the EGFR. And then you can put them into different, uh, you know, uh, terminologies as we all know about what is the stages of uh, CKD, stage one to stage five. And based on the EGFR, you can, you can decide as to where the patient fits in and also look at as per their albumin level. If they're, even if they have an EGFR, which is say 80, which appears like, oh, it's not too bad. But if they're already leaking more than 300 milligrams per gram of protein, then they're at higher risk of progression. So that is how we actually uh, stratify our patients as to what is their baseline risk. And then based on that, all the aggressive uh, first-line therapies, second-line therapies are instituted early. So in terms of how frequently you have to screen, if you don't have any symptoms and the patient actually has no albuminuria and a normal EGFR and is a diabetic, you still have to screen them at least on an annual basis. Now, if they fall into the zone where their EGFR is actually progressively lowered um, and or they have albuminuria, which is gradually getting worse, then you have to screen them more uh, frequently. And uh, common uh, as our uh, recently released uh, KDGO guidelines 2022 for management of diabetes in patients with kidney disease um, also talks about screening them at least every three to six months. Why do you do uh, not screening or checking on them? Because you screen if they're, they're asymptomatic, but if, if they already have CKD, you have to follow them up with these similar tests more frequently. Why? Because then you know whether the interventions are actually effective and how much more. Got it, got it, Dr. Uh, so, uh, Dr. Manzan, coming coming back to you now. So, we uh, you took the first few minutes talking, taking us through the atherosclerotic uh, complications in diabetes. But there's another uh, another thing completely different and a huge part of it on its own, heart failure in uh, people living with di uh, diabetes. Could mm -hmm. you tell me more about high, uh, heart failure in diabetics and how do I screen for it and how do I manage that? Right. No, uh, this, you know, reminds us we used to uh, take these interesting quizzes in CMEs where we would uh, show them a slide and ask people what is the most common complication of uh, diabetes. You know, what is the most common? And then we, we would ask what is the most common cardiac complication of diabetes? And then to give a hint, we'll tell people that, uh, you know, atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease is not the first. Uh, so it, and it is heart failure, right, which is the first one. And a lot of people uh, look at it that it comes at a later stage. It may not 
be that prominent and uh, the focus is again a lot on ASCVD only. Uh, people look at peripheral arterial disease, but people miss out on heart failure, which is the most common, right? Uh, there was a lot of debate on whether diabetes is an ASCVD risk equivalent or not. Uh, and, uh, you know, people initially thought it is, then it is not, then again it is. But unanimously, they say that diabetics is equal to stage A of heart failure. So the diagnosis of diabetes itself puts you in stage A of heart failure. Uh, and that can happen even without other comorbidities, right? Even if you're not hypertensive, even if you don't have any other risk factor, it could put you into that. Uh, also cardiomyopathy, diabetic cardiomyopathy puts you at a risk of uh, heart failure further. Uh, two comes to the screening bit of it, right? And now since we know that every patient is already in stage A, uh, but some may be as pre-HF and may, will not be symptomatic, may not... Uh, you know, complain of breathlessness or come with any symptoms which point towards heart failure, what do you do for those patients? So, uh, one is cardiac biomarkers, right? Using um, NT pro BNP, which uh, again was debated for a long time. So, in 2017, the international guidelines said everybody should do it. 2019, they said, uh, no, uh, you know, let's not do it for everyone. 2021, again, they came back and said, uh, you know, for pre HF is how they called it. Uh, you should do it, but don't rely on it as a sole marker. So, uh, you know, you could start with that as a routine blood test in people who don't have any symptoms, who are newly diagnosed. You have a baseline anti-proBNP level at least monitor. Uh, simpler is also to do an ECG in clinic. Uh, you know, uh, it is not cumbersome. Uh, most clinics will have the facility to do an ECG. And a simple way, again, there is to rule out that, you know, a completely normal ECG will have a very lower chance of heart failure. The best, of course, uh, gold standard screening tool would be an echocardiography, which ideally every diabetic should do annually. Uh, two reasons to it. One is, of course, your LVEF and the LV function that you get to know. Two is the LV mass. So the left ventricular mass, you know, gets affected. Left ventricular hypertrophy is there. You also are able to pick up the LV mass for patients who have obesity, who have dyslipidemia and who have diabetes. And an echocardiography gives you a picture of a lot of things and, uh, you know, setting up that baseline. And a lot of us have that misunderstanding that, you know, uh, it should only be done in symptomatic patients, only done if somebody complains of a breathlessness or has edema, uh, but it's too late by the time you go there. So if you talk of screening, uh, People should do a heart failure screening, you know, first when they come. Of course, I uh, would agree with Dr. Deepa that that should come first, a microalbuminia and an EGFR annually. But don't ignore uh, doing an echocardiography annually just because it's probably a little expensive. Uh, you could start with an NT pro BNP for patients who are completely asymptomatic, very newly diagnosed and don't want one. Maybe at least give them that option. But don't forget to do an ECG every time they come for a follow-up. So uh, that's the least we can do. Thank you, Dr. Manthan. Before I go forward, uh, so I would just like to remind the participants that you could ask your questions in the chat and we'll take it up later after the discussions are over. So uh, I've already asked you, but I don't see any questions. So please, if you have any questions, please put them in the chat. So let me continue with uh, the questions that I already have. So Dr. Deepa, this is for you. So what is your take on the nephroprotective agents with the, the you have new data of uh, these drugs which can uh, protect our kidneys. Uh, where do you place them in your routine practice? And how should you, how do you think that di uh, diabetologists should take advantage of these new drugs? Um, actually, this past decade has been really revolutionary in terms of many new agents that have been tested and they have actually shown to have positive uh, kidney outcomes. Because in the past, if you, which still holds good, how we used to treat diabetes, especially diabetic kidney disease, is our main uh, goal is to, first is in addition to all your uh, general uh, measures for controlling the sugar, the intensive, consistent control of immunoglobin A1C and light cell changes and blood pressure control, we used to really, really push a lot of use of this ACE inhibitors and ARBs as our first line therapy, especially to treat people who have hypertension and also for treating patients with diabetics who have albuminuria, but even if they are not hypertensive, we would still push for these agents. Because the point to remember here is 
the more the proteinuria, the faster your progression of kidney disease. So what we are trying to do is try to reduce the proteinuria and push it back towards either uh, uh, moderately uh, elevated to no proteinuria or no albuminuria. So ACE inhibitors, ARBs, by way of reducing the intraglomerular pressure because they dilate differentially the efferent artery loads, what happens is you are try it tries to reduce the intraglomerular pressures and by that way it will also reduce the protein leakage. But, um, you know, so we would maximize the use of either ACE inhibitors or ARBs and a lot of studies, especially if you look at the IDNT trial in type 2 diabetes, that is uh, one of the studies which has shown that using an a ARB like Arbisartan compared to other antihypertensives like uh, amlodipine or even placebo, even though you have a relatively um, you know, similar control of BP across the three groups, the groups that were uh, given uh, you know, herbicidin, and all of these patients had uh, um, you know, severely elevated albuminuria, which is albumin levels more than 300 milligrams to gram per gram of creatinine, they all had an improvement in the kidney outcomes in terms of a slower decline in EGFR. The maximum decline was seen in the unloaded people. So based on this evidence, the only uh, uh, you know weapon we had in our armamentarium in terms of reducing or slowing down the progression of CKD in diabetics were the maximal use of ACE inhibitors ARBs. But now, since we know the pathophysiology, there are multiple levels at which diabetic milieu affects the kidney and there are different pathways, different, uh, you know, uh, effector uh, cytokines, mediators that can actually lead to uh, uh, various changes that we define as diabetic kidney disease. Now we have three new agents which have been uh, shown to have excellent outcomes in terms of our, uh, um, you know, adverse kidney effects in terms of slowing kidney progression. And the, these have been so uh, remarkable in terms of their uh, trial uh, you know, data that even your KDGO guidelines are released in 2022 as well as the American Diabetic Association guidelines actually have changed their approach and they are now recommending use of some of these agents as first-line therapy for diabetics who have CKD. Uh, so, what are these agents? We have all been talking a lot in the past, uh, you know, I'm sure everybody has heard about the SGLT2 inhibitors. And these are agents which work in the at the level of proximal tubule of the kidney where they prevent the reabsorption of uh, glucose. Along with that, the sodium also does not get reabsorbed. So, there's a lot of uh, glucose that gets wasted in the urine uh, and leads to glycosuria. But rather than being more of a diabetic drug, this actually affects a lot of... Uh, changes in terms of both cardio protection as well as, um, you know, uh, renal protection. Now, I don't have the time to go through tr different trials, but you have so many trials, particularly in terms of cardiovascular outcomes, which have been very, very encouraging. We have heart failure trials, both with preserved ejection fraction as well as reduced ejection fraction with these agents, which are very promising. But we have three trials, particularly looking at kidney outcomes as the primary outcome using these agents. And they have been tried across different uh, EGFR levels. Even if you have EGFR levels in our diabetic patient with CKD as low as 20 ml per minute, remember this is like you're almost reaching, uh, you're at stage four. Even in those patients, we have found that these agents tend to stabilize or at least prolong the um, kidney uh, function. So you're giving your patients a lot more time before they end up on dialysis or in replacement therapy. So the maximum benefit is in patients who are already proteinuric. But for these agents to be acting in a better way and to give them time, you need to first identify patients early, which is why screening is very important. Yeah. So SGLT2 inhibitors are now being... Uh, 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 you know, put forth as first-line agents in patients who are with diabetes with CKD, even if their GFR is as low as 20 ml per minute, you have to start metformin and NSGLT2 as first-line agents. Okay. And then uh, the second agent which has come through is something called phenylalanine, which I think even Dr. Manthan will be very excited about because it has a lot of uh, important cardiovascular benefits too. But essentially, the reason phenylalanine we talk about is it's a menglocorticoid receptor antagonist, but it is a non-steroidal one. So compared to your uh, uh, standard aldactone, which we have been using, which is again a menglocorticoid receptor antagonist, which has a lot of benefits in terms of heart failure and blood pressure control, but it has a lot of side effects too because it's not a very selective blocker. 
phenylalone on the other hand is a very uh, selective non-steroidal mineralocorticoid receptor antagonist and the use of these agents again in two trials called Fidelio and Figaro and then the, uh, the Fidelity analysis trials recently have shown that these agents if you add it on top of say an ACE inhibitor in a diabetic patient they have further benefits in terms of protecting the adverse uh, kidney outcomes and also in terms of cardiovascular protection. So this is the second agent that has come in. And again, uh, since so much new uh, uh, you know, positive outcomes have come in the recent uh, years, our guidelines keep updating. And now even the ADA uh, in 2020, as well as the ADA go in uh, 2022, November, has actually said that if you have proteinuria in a diabetic patient who has chronic kidney disease, despite using maximal doses of ACE inhibitors or ARB and an SGLT2, if despite these two agents, if they still have albuminuria, which is beyond 30 milligrams per gram, that is the moderately elevated albuminuria, then you are justified in adding 10 milligrams per day of phenylalone. Okay, so this is the other thing which has come through. The third thing which has been there for a while, but that is again being pushed at this point is the uh, GLP-1 receptor and, uh, antagonists. Now, uh, these are agents which are diabetic agents, but they have had a lot of very... Uh, good uh, cardiovascular outcomes in terms of reducing MACE or major adverse cardiac outcomes, as well as improving albuminuria control and prolonging kidney life. So if your blood sugar is not controlled with, uh, say, a metformin and an HDLP2 inhibitor, and your patient has CKD and diabetes, our guidelines now say that if they're able to, uh, if they fit the category, if they don't have any contraindication for GLP-1 analogs, receptor analogs, then those are the next uh, preferred agents to be used. Very practically speaking, in our country, if you look at the masses and the affordability, the um, phenylalone is extremely expensive. Yet GLP analogs are mostly injectables. There's one oral formulation, but the uh, treatment is extremely expensive. So it may not be something that we can implement uh, on a large scale. Uh, probably in the next few years when a lot more companies start to make these agents and we, the prices come down. But at least until then, we should really push for trying SGLT2 inhibitors, which have now come down to almost 10 rupees per tablet. And it's a one-day dose. There are certain, you know, do and don'ts with SGLT2 inhibitors. You can't just start it and forget about it. You have to educate the patient, tell them about what the uh, side effects could be. You have to screen them properly for any foot ulcers, peripheral vascular disease, because some side effects are there. Um, and uh, so you have to educate the patient properly and then try to use these agents. So these are the three new, uh, you know, novel drugs which have come out in terms of beneficial effects, particularly towards improving the renal outcomes. Um, in addition to what we already know in terms of ACE inhibitors, ARBs. So these have been added to our armamentum. So hopefully a lot more of our patients benefit and uh, you know we're able to prolong the life of their kidneys with appropriate and early use of these agents. I think uh, the attendants would be very happy with some uh, new intelligence they've picked up which they can use on the patients. Uh, Mantan, uh, Dr. Mantan, we will be taking the questions in the end Please do go through the questions. But right now, uh, since you we were talking about educating the patients and getting the best outcomes from them, counseling them and getting some kind of a changes in their behavior. So uh, my next question is on that. Are there any lifestyle changes which we can advise people with uh, cardiorenal complications? Because most of them have, because of these comorbidities might not have a, uh, uh, that, uh, that uh, you know, they, they might have a very limited scope of movement. They won't be able to exercise. So what kind of lifestyle changes can we uh, advise these patients? Uh, Dr. Mantan, I'll start with you. Yeah, right. I think uh, when we talk of you know lifestyle changes uh, for patients with uh, complications and uh, you know um, with all due respect, I'm sorry to say a lot of patients take you know their other comorbidities as a shield to protect themselves from not doing an exercise or not doing something. So uh, I'm sure, uh, you know, patients with heart disease and kidney disease do not have a, a strong contraindication to not do an exercise or to not go through lifestyle changes. Uh, but people, uh, I mean, A is that part of it. B is the part that living with a disease and its complications adds to the stress element of it, which is really not focused when we talk of, talk of lifestyle, right? I think uh, lifestyle has become synonymous with uh, diet and exercise. And we overlook these elements that living with diabetes, living with diabetes and a heart disease and a kidney disease 
is very challenging for patients themselves on a day to day basis so uh, i think we need to spend more time with them if if you know uh, we can or if we can afford a counselor or we have somebody like that in our setup i think it works well if not of course there are you know digital therapeutic options where people can actually you know get these kind of advice on on a more day to day basis than what they would probably be getting in clinic uh, but i think we need to uh, dedicate a lot of time uh, and effort explaining them that lifestyle medications uh, interventions are important apart from the medications that we are giving them so it's not that just uh, you know writing a pill or the the sglt2 inhibitors or glp1 today which have cardiovascular benefits which have kidney benefits and they reduce your risk of disease over years is not going to work well unless you know you make those attempts and change your lifestyle so it uh, just doesn't work that we we leave we rely a lot on the pills i think as doctors we rely lesser sometimes on the pills uh, and we push them to do it but we also are to blame we don't push them hard enough uh, for lifestyle modifications which should be i think is the first line of treatment for everything and we should uh, for these diseases in particular and we should harp on that and focus that that this is what you do first with that i'm giving you these medications thank you dr deepa your your views on this what kind of behavior changes would you expect to see in your patients with diabetes and kidney disorder you know uh, the first and foremost thing is we need to also be empathetic and realize that this is a chronic disease and we have to first end up building a rapport with the patient and we need to be sure that whatever language we are speaking i'm not talking literally about language it's like whatever we are writing or we are telling them in namak mat khao uh potassium wali cheez mat khao are they even understanding or have you understood what uh, how they have interpreted it so i think that barrier has to be broken so ideally yes you have to spend time with the patient and not so much so just giving them the gyan if i may use the language but in terms of listening to what their constraints are so in my kind of uh, practice where we rely a lot of dietary advice that we have to give them particularly related to ckd related diet especially low salt low potassium low phosphorus and limiting excess protein just a uh, uh, you know one fit uh, uh, doesn't uh, you know one uh, whatever uh, prescription you have doesn't really fit all you have to take the effort to uh, talk to the patients understand where the constraints are give them certain uh, tips about how uh, you know listen to them about how they eat what they eat what their preferences are and then give them a little bit of changes there that i think will go a long way and many a times we just tell them like go exercise but we don't understand that a lot of these patients are uh, probably having uh, uh, joint problems they are having obesity issues they may have cardiovascular issues which may not permit them to do the exercise so what i tell them is you don't have to think about exercise meaning join the, the gym and building up muscles even simple things like you know get up and walk if you're not able to walk out walk at home there are a lot of walking uh, videos available just walk for 30 minutes a day so if you give them this kind of encouraging steps and you kind of give them the feeling that you're there with them through this whole journey i think that has a lot of benefits than just sitting and prescribing something and expecting that to work so dietitian part properly educating them about starting slow consistently a lot of times you know there's a lot of stress in their lives so probably digging a little deeper maybe referring them earlier to a psychologist because people let's face it they get depressed if you tell them that hey your kidneys are not uh, optimal you have cardiac problems too you're diabetic too uh, that person is actually going to go down in terms of how he is feeling so you need to make sure that they are mentally also kept motivated to encourage them with uh, telling them about how the medications affect and how you need to uh, continue to uh, you know follow up with these uh, lifestyle advices and work with them see them regularly in follow up and what i really think benefits is having a team approach we cannot just be doing individual organ care we have to talk to each other so ideally if you have a typical utopian uh, era would be you have like a diabetic clinic where simultaneously the patient ends up meeting not only your diabetologist but the nephrologist gets the eyes checked gets their foot checked meets with a dietitian meets with a fitness person also probably meets with a psychologist because a lot of times these patients need a boost to continue with all of this lifestyle changes and particularly with kidney failure patients 
uh, because we deal with a lot of chronic uh, diseases which we know may not get any better. So you have to do something to cheer up the patient and make sure that they remain motivated. So a lot of talking, you have to spend time and you know that has just got to be done if you really want to get uh, efforts. So start slow, be consistent, uh, give them a diet that actually correlates with their dietary habits. You can't tell them, Achha, you start eating feta cheese, you start eating olives and all those things when they don't even know what that means. So talk to them in the language that they understand. The dietitian should go down to things that they eat. And a lot of time people end up just stopping food because they are so scared. And that is counterproductive because you need to tell them what you can eat. That's where a proper dietitian also comes into play. And this is something which has to be implemented early. So that you are working with the patient. The patient has to get the feeling that he's got a team who are working for him or her. So I think we have to spend time in terms of uh, being there for our patients. Yeah. Uh, Dr. Shivani, I, I just wanted to pick up your questions right now. But uh, Dr. Poor, Dr. Deepa has mentioned a very interesting point for me, which I will push on to Manthan now. So Dr. Manthan, uh, Dr. Deepa mentioned about the need of, probably the need of a psychologist in this whole team. What's your take on this? Do you think mm -hmm. that uh, this is one thing we have just never looked at in diabetes and uh, especially in complicated diabetes? Yeah. No, uh, I, I agree to the point. I'm happy that there are more people like her, you know, who actually look at this and are willing to talk to the patient about it. You, uh, I, I recently, I think at IDS, we saw a paper on diabetic distress uh, in patients and it turned out, uh, you know, that the distress is, of course, very high. One in three patients had distress. And then that further broken them down to say that a large chunk of its distress came from physician distress. So it's because they felt that, you know, my doctor doesn't understand me well, you know, and uh, harping that on uh, Dr. Deepa's point, like, you know, we tell them, ye mat khana, ye mat karna, and we don't actually sit and explain a lot of things to them. So uh, that does you know, add to the stress of it. And we must accept that, you know, as we are experts in our therapies, we are expert in medicine to prescribe them something, they need other experts, you know, and a holistic care cannot happen without mental well-being. And having a psychologist on board, uh, just talking to them, understanding them, understanding those pain points, even simple things like explaining them to live with the disease, you know, those coping mechanisms itself, uh, makes a large difference in therapy. I think, you know, they become more compliant because, uh, you know, patients are motivated to do things. It's not that they don't want to do things for their health, but they don't get the right direction that where do I start, you know, and then today with Google and now I think with AI and chat GPT, they're going to go and ask them, what do I do for this? And they're going to get a lot of generic answers, which, you know, may not fit everyone, right? One size doesn't fit all. Somebody may have distress for living with the disease. Somebody may have distress of the diagnosis. Somebody may have distress of the restrictions. Somebody may have distress of taking medications. Uh, you know, everything is very different, right? And people, we, we what we give them is general information. And I know I'm guilty as charged, right? Tell patients that stress mat lena. And it, it ends there, you know? <laughs> and we don't really tell them, we don't even understand what stress they have. So. Sometimes when they ask me, Ki, you know, and there is a lot of polyprescription in cardiology, in diabetes, you see eight drugs, 10 drugs, and you tell them, you, they tell them, I cannot, do I have to take so many? I'm like, Thik ho na na, to lena padega. so we, we really just push it there. And, you know, we probably, we should also, I think, learn that empathy and learn to talk, but we may not be able to give as much time or do it in an expert way as what a psychologist does. So. Uh, we should, you know, send patients there and learn the right way to communicate why they need a psychologist because of the taboo which still exists in India, right? That uh, yeah. sending to a psychologist like my diabetes thik karwane aaya hu and you are referring me to a psychologist and the, you know we are all worried like okay now this patient what are they going to think about me? But so we just need to learn that in the right way. Yeah, I think. I mean, it's not going to be for every patient, but for yeah. some of them. Uh, you definitely feel, and you cannot, you don't have the expertise of everybody. You don't have the expertise of a complete dietitian, a fitness person, and maybe a psychologist, the patient is really getting overwhelmed with all the medications and all the bad news that you're telling them. But in those select patients, at least if you have like a coordinated comprehensive care, uh, because diabetes 
I don't see it as a single disease alone. Where I see the kidney and then say, okay, then you can see your cardiologist, see the eye person. They just going to get completely demotivated. So I think in some select who are not able to tackle, definitely I think getting them the help early will make a big difference in them being compliant with their therapy too and staying positive. I, I agree that this multidisciplinary approach is very much required. Uh, Dr. Mantan, could you take the uh, question and answers, please? Sure. So Dr. Shivani asks about what guidelines talk about NP-proBNP. So uh, Dr. Shivani, you know, uh, the ADA and there was an in, uh, international consensus group that came forward from the ESC and as well as the EHA. Let's say that annual screening of NP-proBNP is something that is recommended. Uh, they follow that as uh, a screening technology. Uh, two is, you know, if your patients have symptoms, so whether they've done it in the past, one is to have a baseline. Two is, you know, if you have done NT pro BNP in the past, you have a baseline value and a patient comes with symptoms, so, you know, is now in NYHA class three, is in NYHA class four, you can repeat one and see, you know, where the difference lies. Two, uh, once you've done the NT pro BNP, please again, take steps to go further as well. So, you know, you could uh, do a six minute walk test, do an echocardiography and go further beyond it. Uh, for routine patients and annual screening is what the guidelines. I think the question was for me, right? Potassium yes, EGFR. Yeah. So um, it's, a, it's a great question. In fact, I think this will be holding true even for your ACE inhibitors ARVs because even with those agents, one of the main challenge in, or the limitations in terms of maximizing the dose of ARV ACE inhibitors is you have this problem of potassium creeping up. So uh, with phenylalanine, as per what the studies have done, they really did not take patients who had a serum potassium more than 5.5. They did not uh, use phenylalanine. But general guidelines is if your potassium is more than 5.5, then probably it's not safe to continue phenylalanine because though it does not have as much of a risk of hyperkalemia compared to aldactone, there still is a risk. So uh, you may want to not take those patients, especially if they're not compliant with diet or if you're worried they may not follow up, then you don't want problems of hyperkalemia. But if they're falling in the zone of, uh, you know, between say 4.9 to 5.5, you can continue with the same, uh, you know, dose of phenylalanine, but you monitor them at least every, uh, you know, um, four months, three to four months, so that you have a check as to what the potassium levels are. If their potassium levels are less than 4.8, then you can easily continue phenylalanine, but still tell them about the diet control of potassium. And if at all you feel that they may benefit from a higher dose of phenylalanine, like 20 milligrams, and if their potassium is extremely well controlled, like less than four and a half, then you may even try to give them that extra benefit by going to 20 milligrams. Now, some general measures that I adopt in my practice is C. Whenever you use ACE inhibitors, ARVs, or even phenylalanine, what happens is there is going to be a reduction in your EGFR, um, and then there is going to be a little rise in your serum creatinine and potassium because that's how the drug works. But as long as it is up to a 30% rise in your creatinine or EGFR, uh, or your, uh, especially your creatinine or EGFR, there's no reason to panic and stop the drug because eventually it will stabilize. But you need to monitor that. And how do you offset the hyper hyperkalemia? You can make sure that if they're also acidotic, you can add a soda bicarb, metabolic acidosis, that will take care of the hyperkalemia part. You obviously have to count, uh, counsel them about high potassium diet. And there are a few uh, really um, you know, good agents, that uh, things which are culprits like coconut water, um, bananas, potatoes, tomatoes. And there's a whole process of bleaching, how you can remove the potassium from the diet when you want to use. So that's where a dietitian comes into play. So putting them on a lower potassium diet and still using these agents is probably the right thing to do, provided you're able to monitor the potassium. Then the other thing you can do is maybe combine with a low dose of diuretic, I usually add like a CTD or if their EGFR is say a little lower, like if it is already in the 30s to 35 ml per minute, then you can add a loop diuretic. Um, uh, so in that sense, you can buy, you can sort of balance the hyperkalemia effect. Largely in some patients, uh, even though they're completely asymptomatic and I'm finding that their proteinuria is getting better with ACE inhibitor ARB or phenylalanine, you know, frankly, I've not used so much because it's very expensive. It's 90 rupees per tablet. I've only used it in a few patients of mine. But uh, if ACE inhibitors ARBs, I have more data. So if their potassium is on the higher side, despite, uh, you know, diet control and a diuretic, then I also give them a K-bind from time to time, which to bind the potassium. The reason being, I'm seeing effects in terms of reduction in their albuminuria. 
So I want to give them the benefit of continued use of asymmetric ARDs. But despite that, if it is not getting better, obviously then you have to cut down on the dose of asymmetric ARDs or even stop the phenylalanine. So that's my take of how you handle your hypokalemia. You have to recheck it within two weeks of starting a medicine or two weeks of increasing the dose so you know where the potassium creatinine is. And uh, if it has gone jump too much, then yes, you may need to back off on the medicine. But if they are stable, I still check every three months just to be make sure that they are not, uh, especially if you have a lower EJ bar because you have a higher risk of potassium building up. I think the other question also was uh, for me in terms of the metformin. Um, see, previously, our uh, the, the study was like up to 45 ml per minute EGFR, you can use metformin. Below that, no stop it because uh, there's a high risk of lactic acidosis. But frankly speaking, at least for our country, it's a cheap drug. It helps in weight loss. It's an excellent drug. So now, as per the recent guidelines, we have actually limited, uh, we, have, we have permitted use of uh, metformin up to an EGFR of 30 ml per minute. Okay, But when is it that you really need to stop the metformin? If they are going for any surgical procedure, uh, especially if there is a risk that their blood pressure may fluctuate, because in those scenarios, you may have a higher risk of lactic acidosis. So generally before, say, if they're going for an angio, uh, I always stop isnibit ARB and metformin peri procedure. Or if they are really sick, if they're having nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, and already their volume depleted, and then there's a higher risk of, um, you know, uh, hypotension-related lactic acidosis, then you obviously stop the metformin there. But, but otherwise, up to 30 ml per minute uh, and above, uh, as per guidelines, you can use metformin, but always clinical judgment uh, prevails first. Right. Uh, I think we have done the questions. Uh, Dr. Deepa, before I close this, I know you have to leave by five. So before I close this, could you give us, so we all are doctors over here who have been treating uh, diabetes for years now. If you wanted as a nephrologist to give them one takeaway from you, from this uh, event, uh, what, would you, what would you tell them, ma'am? I think the first thing what I'm going to tell them, uh, which I'm sure most people already do, but it's very important, is please screen your patients, even if they don't have symptoms. Please screen them, advise the patients that you don't have to wait for symptoms to come annually or at least uh, if they have some uh, CKD already, at least may every three to four months, please get their serum creatinine, EGFR, urine routine. It's a simple test, not that expensive and a spot urine albumin to creatinine ratio. Ensure that they are uh, taking the ACE inhibitor ARVs and monitor their blood pressure in terms of proper home blood pressure checkups, educate the patient. Um, and make sure the blood pressure control is absolutely uh, pristine in terms of right now guidelines, say 120, 80. Um, so educate the patients about screening so that we pick up patients, institute all these good agents that we have now early, and also probably early referral to a specialist. If at all you find that their EGFR is coming down, if they're in late stage 3B, then uh, it may also help to involve a nephrologist uh, earlier so that uh, um, you know, we can further intensify the care and try to take measures to prolong the uh, uh, you know, kidney function in these patients. So screening is probably my main uh, take-home message and early institution of all these new agents so that we maximally give our patients time to benefit from these agents. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Mantan, your final take i think uh, i'll agree to what uh, dr deepa said and two is uh, communicate i think communicate with the patient more clearly uh, talk to them about the complications don't scare them uh, you know fear mongering is is not something we should we keep telling them that this is going to get spoiled and this will get affected but show them the path you tell them that you're going to get that complication but this is how you avoid that so you know, uh, of course, screening is one uh, because a lot of things are asymptomatic. Two is uh, communication. So communicate with them uh, more openly and more positive. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Mandan. Uh, thank you, Dr. Deepa, for sparing the time for us. And I want, to thank, thank you. I want to thank the audience for uh, being so patient with us and actually listening to us throughout the one hour. Most, most of them were with us since the beginning and they've stayed us with us. Thank you, Dr. Shivani, especially for being so active with us. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank Very you. Nice. Thank you.